Good morning, everyone. Uh, very excited for our guest today, uh, Annie Duke. Uh, and there's plenty of things that I want to get into, uh, into discussion with, so I'm not going to waste a ton of time talking on the front end. Um, but obviously, here's, here's another person who can help provide some scaffolding. We're trying to find folks that say it's going to be okay, um, that this is how we're going to navigate this thing, because no, nobody knows. Uh, there, there are so many unknowns. So that's what we're continuously building uh, these conversations with uh, all people. Um, so I want to bring Annie in. Annie, thank you so much for spending some time with us this morning. Um, would love would love to kick it off with this. One, obviously, how are you doing? And and two, um, as a prof professional poker player, uh, you've been dealt plenty of hands that you probably did not want, but you made the best out of it. So I would love to know, because every everybody has been dealt a, a different hand than expected over the last few months. I would love some insights on how, how, how you deal with that, how you, how you make the most out of it. Yeah, so, I, you know, I, I think that a lot of my kind of outlook on life is that uh, the world is, th the things are always are very uncertain. Um, I think that we are pretty good at kind of imagining that we have a lot more control over what's going on in our lives than we actually do. And there are certain things that really kind of like reveal the uncertainty in this really big way. Uh, there are events that that can occur that really show kind of you you don't necessarily have to have you, you don't necessarily have control. Um, you know, and things like this or, you know, natural weather disasters or um you know, that kind of stuff just really kind of bubbles it to the surface. So the way that I think about what's happened with coronavirus is that it's really just sort of like pulled the curtain back on how much uncertainty in our lives uh, there are. And so there's a lot, I think, to be learned about how do you think through, how do you make decisions, not just in situations where uh, things have gotten really crazy, but, but also what lessons can you take in terms of how when things go back to what feels more normal about how you should be thinking through how you sort of react to uh, to what's going on in your life and how you make decisions going forward. Because I think there's just a lot of lessons when we can see the uncertainty so clearly about how you can take that kind of view of the world into your into your everyday decisions. Annie, that, what's interesting is, so would you say, and this may be a misinterpretation that Right now in times of crisis, we're actually more in reality than we are in everyday life. Meaning, you know, like you said, we have this false sense of control, like all these things are happening. We don't realize it. And so now, so is the mindset we have now, is that the mindset we should have every day? And I, cause I just find it interesting that, you know, we're maybe living in a little fantasy on an everyday basis. Yeah, so I think you put that really well. <laughs> um, you know, I think that uh, right now everything's so in your face that the future is not determined for us and that whenever we make any decision, there's all sorts of different ways that it could turn out. Um, you know, I mean, you can make, you know, this is one of the things that I think poker teaches you really well, right? I, I can make a decision and I can put all my money in the pot when I'm going to win the pot 98% of the time. But once I've done that, I have no control after that point about whether I win the pot or not. It's my money's gone in the pot. I'm going to win 98% of the time. 2% of the time, some awful card is going to hit on the end. And I don't have any control over when that's going to happen. So whenever I'm making a decision, I'm not making a decision thinking I'm going to make a decision and then I know what the future is going to hold. Instead, I'm making decisions saying there's all sorts of different ways that the future could turn out and I need to be thinking about all of those and trying to figure out, given what my options are, what kind of works the best across what all the possible ways that it could turn out are, given whatever the things are that I value and whatever my resources are. And then I also have to be thinking, uh, if it doesn't turn out a way that I happen to like, I have to be thinking in advance about the way that I'm going to react to that so that I'm not always being reactive and rather I can be nimble. So now that we're in this situation with coronavirus where things are very, very unpredictable right now, it's actually closer to what real life decision-making looks like. It's just that you can't hide from it anymore. 
do, do you feel like like being prepared for the reaction is part of the challenge that businesses are in right now that they just weren't and that they they didn't think ahead so that's where they're they're in complete scramble or stress mode right now so you know what i would say is that uh when you're when you're talking about outcomes that are are really 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 rare like a pandemic uh you know if you're a government having a pandemic response team is really good like just sort of having that in your back pocket so that you've already thought about how you might react to that is is a really good thing to do that being said for you know if you're like a particular business owner thinking about something that's that incredibly rare might not necessarily be the, the best use of your time. That being said, there's all sorts of ways to get to already having a plan in place for something that would encompass uh, something like a pandemic. Because if you're just thinking in general about, let me think about what if in six months, the economy has really taken a bad turn that has a very deep effect on uh, people's willingness to spend money, for example, in my business. And you're, you're sort of always trying to get ahead of that. And you're thinking about why might those things be happening? And if that were to occur, what would my reactions be to that? Um, then that helps you get some preparation for something like this. And then when you're training yourself to think that way, then when you're actually in the midst of it and you get faced with this, you tend to be thinking much more rationally about what the things are that you need to do. So you'll, you'll be farther ahead in terms of your decision making. And then you can be doing the same things. Because when you think about something like what's happened with the economic downturn in terms of coronavirus, it's the same exercise, which is what's the recovery going to look like? So you would want to think in advance about what do I think things look like if it's a V-shaped recovery? What do I think it looks like if it's more of a U-shaped recovery? What do I think uh, it looks like if it's more like an L-shaped recovery? So is it just like a very quick economic downturn and as soon as the sort of external pressures are released, the things just boom back. Is it, a, is it more like a recession or is it more like a depression? Um, and the more that you can kind of get ahead and think about those scenarios, uh, the better off you're gonna be. And you can do this kind of, you know, you could, you could have been doing this pre-COVID and just thinking in general about what happens if the economy goes in a way that it's not going right now. But certainly in terms of where we are right now, you would definitely wanna be thinking about that. So, so as an example, uh, one of the things that I've worked with my clients on is to get them to really think about, um, we'd all like it, obviously, to be a V-shaped recovery. Uh, but what if it's more U or L-shaped? Um, and it's we're now talking about it's the beginning of 2021, and we're still in an economic downturn. Think about it's January of 2021. We're still in an economic downturn. What are the things that you wish that you hadn't spent money on today? So it's like thinking backwards to, to that. And that helps you to clarify what are the things that I want to be doing today to prepare for a variety of different types of recovery. Annie, like <clears throat> I preface this by saying you're speaking at a high level. Some of my comments are sort of juvenile or at eighth grade level. No, it's all good. <laughs> But what, what do you, like, what's your advice for someone right now? Like I am, I just got off the phone with banks about PPP loans, you know, and we're supporting, we're a franchise law firm supporting our clients. I have anger and rage right now where I want to go, like, keep pushing the offense and totally out of defense too. Like, I feel like I need to be on offense to defend my team, to defend what we're building, but also I I get that could lead to blind spots and mistakes. So how do you recommend balancing that? And how do you mentally evaluate a good offensive strategy? Yeah, so I'm trying to think. So I'm, I'm horrible at poker. I go all in. The only reason why I'll ever win in these stupid tournaments, the little ones, is because I just do things no normal person would because I don't know, right? So how do I make sure I'm not doing that in life? with business decisions. Yeah, so I, you know, generally what I think that happens to us all is that when we're in the middle of a decision, like when we're in the middle of the moment, we're all pretty bad decision makers, I am too. So uh, this is particularly true when, when we're in the middle of a moment where we're losing, which every single person right now is, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, 
we're, we're all we're all sort of in this really bad streak right now with what's happening with coronavirus. So um, in those cases, we tend to be pretty poor decision makers. So I'm, I'm going to make my worst decisions when I've been on a losing streak in poker, when I've just lost a, a, a few hands in a row. And there's a couple of different ways that, that people tend to be, react to that, but they tend to be pretty categorical. Uh, there's a type of person, which it sounds like you might be more in this category, who one, once you've lost a few hands in a row, you just go on offense. Like you're, you're just trying to, to just get, get it back and make it not be that way anymore. It just sort of, that's your whole strategy is I'm just going to bet big and I'm just going to keep going at it. And I'm going to keep being offensive. Um, and then there's another person who says, I don't want to play at all. And they actually become very, they, they go into total defense. So I'm sure you know people like that as well, who just kind of go into complete defense. So you're, you're either really attacking or you tend to be in your shell. And of course, what you want is kind of a mixed strategy because what we'd always like to be doing is being, being on offense when it's appropriate and when it actually gets us to achieve our goals and being on defense when it's appropriate and that actually helps us to achieve our goals. So what I would really suggest is that always try to do this type of time traveling and you can do it in kind of small doses, or you can do it in big doses. So let me talk about the big dose first. Um, what's really helpful in terms of thinking about strategically, what do I want to do in this moment, is to do what's called a pre-mortem and what's called a backcast. And you can do this in the broad sense, or you can do it around a particular decision. So let's talk about it in the broad sense. Okay, so let's say that uh, uh, you want to do a backcast. And what you would do is you would say, it's you just pick a timeline, let's call it January 2021. Um, and my business is thriving. It's doing really, really well. I came through the pandemic really well. And now everything's great. So you're imagining that it's January 2021. And you're now looking back. And you say to yourself, how did I get here? How, how did I get to this place where my where my business is doing really well? And you want to broadly think about two categories. One is what are the decisions that I personally made? Uh, so those might be, uh, for example, you might be thinking about how uh, I made really judicious decisions about reduction in force, for example, right? That, that might be in there. Um, but so what are the decisions that I made that helped me get to this place where it's January, January 2021 and I'm really doing great? And then also what are the matters of luck? So you could imagine a matter of luck might be uh, they actually come up with a vaccine really fast. And by August, there's a vaccine. So obviously, I assume that you're not working on a vaccine. So that would be out of your hands. And that would be a matter of luck. So you think about that. That's called a backcast. That's OK. I've gotten to a really good future. How did I get there? What were the decisions that I made that helped me to get there? And then what were the matters of luck that occurred? And then you do something side by side with that, which is called a pre-mortem where you imagine it's 2021 and my business is doing horribly. It's really bad. Um, and then you do the same thing. How do I think I got there? What were the decisions that I made that I think caused me to be in this position? And what were the matters of, of luck that occurred? So, so for example, a matter of luck might be they, they've come up with no viable treatment for coronavirus. They still don't have a vaccine. You know, you can imagine those things that don't have anything to do with anything that you can control and you just want to identify those. Um, and then you would think about what are the things that were within my decision making power. Now, what's going to come up in something like that was that all I did was play offense. I didn't realize when I should be backing off and when I should have been more defensive. That's going to be something that's like on that list. Um, so that's kind of on a global measure. You can also do that in terms of a particular decision. So if you're thinking about um, I, I'm, I'm imagining I'm making a decision to approach a particular problem in a particular way. Uh, and I'm thinking that I'm going to just play offense here. Um, and then you can say, okay, it's a week later and I regret having done that. Why do I think that is like, it turned out poorly. Why, why did it turn out poorly? What went wrong? Because I had made that decision. Um, and then you can also say it went really well. You can do the exact same thing and backcast that and say it, it was the perfect thing and it got me exactly to where I wanted to. Why do I think that that occurred? Um, you know, you can do that for hiring or firing decisions as well. Um, and so basically what you always want to do is kind of pull yourself out of the moment and get yourself ahead. 
Now, once you've identified those lists of things, you can now start to do things about them. Because now what you've done is you've basically said, okay, here are the things that I would have done if it turned out poorly. So let me try to figure out how to avoid doing those things. And here are the things that I would have done if it had turned out well. Let me try to figure out how I can make those things more likely to occur. And then even with the things that have to do with luck, you can actually do something with that. And there's a couple of things you can do. One thing is you can say, if I know that this bad luck is going to have um, a really bad effect on my business, is there something I can do in terms of my own decision making that reduces the impact of that luck on my on my business? And that's what we just basically call a hedge. Um, and so an example of that, if I think about how how is it that I could reach financial ruin, one of the ways might be my house burns down. Okay, well, I maybe I can't control like a, a fire coming toward my house, but what I can do is buy insurance. So you think about how, how might I sort of reduce the impact of the bad luck um, through maybe some sort of hedge, like you know, buying insurance or something like that. The other thing you can do is say, well, I can't control the bad luck, but let me actually get ahead of it and think if that bad luck were to occur, let me think now about how I would react to it as opposed to trying to react to it in the moment when I know that I'm gonna be kind of my worst self because I'm gonna be really emotional that this bad luck has just happened to me. So let me actually put that plan in place in advance and do some really good scenario planning that allows me to get ahead of it. Annie, I, in terms of decision making, I'm, I'm glad, Nick, I'm sorry. No, I was just gonna say, I mean, in, in terms of advice, I mean, mm -hmm. like, that's what local governments should be saying about social distancing. Like you just gave the pathway of you're, you're going to look at getting the virus as bad luck. And if you don't have it now, you can, you can apply it there. So it, it's, it's great advice for life period. Yeah. So actually, if you think about, for example, the hedging thing, right? What I said about uh, maybe you should buy fire insurance, right? If one of the ways that your life really goes south is that your house burns down. So this is something that I actually wrote about. And this is why I think that what's happening with coronavirus really pulls back the curtain on all the kinds of decision making that we're really usually making. It's just that we think that we have a lot more certainty and we think that we have a lot more control than we do. And we think that there's much less of an influence of, of luck on our lives in general. And so this actually, I think thinking through this gives you a really good look into the way that you should be operating in any environment. So, so first of all, let me just say in general, Right now, we're in the state of really high uncertainty where this kind of scenario planning, right, where you're thinking about things have gone poorly, how did that happen, things have gone well, you also want to be thinking through, uh, if it's a U-shaped recovery, what does that look like for me in six months? If it's a V-shaped recovery, what would I have wanted to do to be able to take advantage of that? If it's an L-shaped recovery, what, what are the things that I would have wanted to do in my business? And you want to sort of be getting ahead of all three of those scenarios as opposed to just like, making one humongous bet on a v-shaped recovery you want to think about how can i actually be prepared for all three of those we should be doing that regardless of whether you know COVID is around anyway because all of those things are always a possibility anyway but when we think about like from a from a, a just sort of generally decision making around COVID itself you can see this kind of thing in play so so i'll give you an example so in december there starts to be, you know, some intelligence apparently happening that there might be something going on in uh, China. I remember seeing a news report at the beginning of January um, that there was a, a virus in, in China. Um, then I remember sort of like seeing pictures in early January of, you know, people in suits be spraying the streets in China. So now this starts to look to me as a citizen to be like, this looks like kind of a bad thing that's happening in China. Now, I assume that the intelligence that, that the government is getting is much better than what, what I'm actually seeing. But as a citizen, this is what I'm seeing. So this is actually a really good case of look ahead and see what the different scenarios are. So you can imagine thinking, OK, let's say that it's now March and the virus has not gotten any kind of foothold in America. So that would be a backcast, right? What, it, what are the actions? What are the things that happened that allowed us to get to that point where the virus didn't get a foothold in America? And some of those are gonna have to do with decisions that the government might have made. 
um, having to do with, for example, travel bans. Um, uh, and some of them are going to just going to be due to luck, right? It, it could be that something happens and the virus mutates and it dies out or R naught goes down or, you know, whatever it is, right? So uh, some of those you're not going to have control over. It's just going to sort of die out. Um, and then you can do the same thing. It's March and the virus is just like widespread and it's all over the place and our healthcare system is overwhelmed. What are the things that occurred that got us to that place? And you could walk through that. Now, once you start to do that, you can really kind of see uh, what are the actions that you would want to be taking and what would you not want to be, be taking. And that's actually where you can see this idea of hedging come in. So what is a hedge against a virus going to be? Uh, it would be actually uh, spending, for example, all of February um, stockpiling tests and making sure that you had enough tests and enough PPE. So those are things that are somewhat inexpensive, certainly in comparison to the national debt. And this is the really interesting thing about hedges. There's kind of three really important things to think about with hedges, and you can see this in insurance, right? It costs something. Insurance costs something if you want to buy insurance on your house. Um, uh, it mitigates the effect of the downside, like of the bad outcomes occurring, which obviously like fire insurance does that. If my house burns down, uh, I don't experience financial ruin in the same way because someone gives me money to be able to build a new house. So that's mitigating the, the, the impact of, of those downside events. But then this is the really important thing, the third thing, which is you hope you never have to use it. So when, when I buy fire insurance, I'm hoping that my house never burns down and it never becomes a thing that I have to actually use this fire insurance. So you could think about that in terms of coronavirus. If I spend, as a, a public policy person, if I spend a whole bunch of money and resources to create tests um, and I stockpile those and I, I create the infrastructure to be able to do that and I spend six weeks doing that, my hope is actually that I never, ever have to use them. That's what you're hoping for. Um, but if it does turn out that the virus gets onto our shores, having that testing capacity actually acts as a very good hedge because it, it makes it much easier to track it and contain it and so on and so forth, which then reduces the impact of the fact that it's actually made it uh, to America. So, um, but I think that what happens is that in general, because of this third weird thing about hedges, which is that you hope you never have to use them, that when you don't use them, you can fall into this trap of regretting that you had the hedge in the first place. So it happens not to be true for insurance because mortgage companies make you buy the insurance. So you kind of don't have a choice about having those kinds of hedges in place. But um, you can think about this in a really simple way in terms of people's portfolios, right? When when the, the stock market is rising, everybody's really sad that they have any bonds in their portfolios. But when the stock market is, is going down, everybody's really sad that they own equities. But what those are really doing is acting as hedges against each other, right? The, the stocks are your play and then the hedge is hedging against an, an economic downturn. Um, so when there is no economic downturn, everybody's calling their financial advisors saying, why do I have a 60-40 split equities to, to bonds? I want to be 80-20 or I want to have 100% equities because they kind of forget what that hedge is there for. Um, and you kind of lose sight of the fact that you shouldn't regret that you put those things in place because they're there for a reason. They're there for exactly if your house does burn down, you, that then you're not experiencing the same degree of impact from whatever the downside is. So you should be applying that concept to all sorts of stuff in your life. Any moving, you know, working off of that, right? And I, I know you work with a number of business clients and, and by the way, your framework for analysis is amazing. It, it truly is. Um, in terms of a complete paradigm for evaluating and pushing decisions through. I've I honestly, I've never, um, I mean, it's just so complete. Focusing on hedges, right? I guess one hedge would always be for a business cash reserves, right? Yes. Like, so now as you work with your clients and we have this curtain revealed, right? We're not, you know, we're all going to die and life changes <laughs> in two seconds, right? Yes. We all wake up thinking like, Every day is like, you know, I'm never going to die or 
I guess that's how we spend our whole lives, avoiding that, right? But what are some of the hedges that you think are going to be front and center post-COVID as we recover? Things that now become textbook, these need to be in your hedge arsenal. Well, so, okay, so let, let me just say that sometimes, sometimes hedges can be sort of like a little bit on the positive side, like, uh, again, because they cost money, right? So, and you can think about the downside as an absence of something. So as an example, uh, if you were, if you're sort of making a bet on like a U-shaped recovery, but, but you'd regret not being prepared for a V-shaped recovery, you could, um, just as an example, you could keep a, a salesperson on. Like when you're thinking about re reduction in force, you could spend the money to keep a salesperson on that's specifically there to be able to take advantage of a V-shaped recovery. So that would also be a hedge. Now, notice that if it's a U-shaped recovery, you might regret not, not having also uh, laid off or, or put that person on furlough, right? But, but you're, you're specifically keeping them so that you're prepared for something that might happen in the future. So I just want to make clear that, that hedges can kind of work in both directions in that sense. Does, does that make sense? No, that, that, like, it does make sense. And it really takes the analysis to another level. Absolutely. Yeah. So you want to think about, uh, like, downside could be that you weren't prepared for something good happening. Right. So it's, it's that weird kind of, like, sort of putting it on its head as well. So you want to think about it in both directions. Um, this is what I think is going to happen. I, I, you know, what in general I think is going to happen is that people are going to be over-indexed to what has just happened with COVID. Um, and so I think that people are going to swing probably to way too much the conservative side, um, because that generally tends to be what happens to us. Um, uh, and you really want to be sitting where you're kind of prepared uh, across the board for what the sort of really likely sets of outcomes are. And then you want to be hedged against risk of ruin, right? But what people are going to estimate their risk of ruin at is going to be way too high for a little while. So when you think about something like cash reserves and how much cash reserves do you want, I imagine that people are probably going to uh, flip to having too much cash on hand, like more than they actually need. So we've been sitting in a situation where people have much less cash on hand than they actually probably really should have. Um, but now we'll probably flip for a while where people are going to be overly um, uh, pessimistic about what the future might hold as we come out of this crisis and and what doing the pre-mortem and the backcast together does is it helps you to actually get more into a sweet spot there. So I think that the the immediate after effects is that you're going to see people uh, overly pessimistic and overly um, indexed to what has kind of just happened. The other thing is that they're going to be uh, thinking too much about what's called the last disaster. So um, so let me explain what that is. So uh, if you look at a place like um, uh, Singapore or Taiwan, right? They were actually really, really well prepared for coronavirus in terms of people were already wearing masks. They were, they were all already prepared for social distancing. They were doing some social distancing already, even before coronavirus came around. They certainly had, I think they had maybe, it was somewhere near two times as many hospital beds per person as we do, I think. It was, I know it's a lot more. I'm not exactly sure if it was two times. Um, tons and tons of PPE. Uh, and they had a lot of testing capacity. So the question is like, why is that? Like, why were they so prepared for it? And the answer is because their last really big disaster was SARS. So they were really indexed to what the last big disaster was. And so that caused them to be prepared for this disaster because this disaster looked a lot like the last one. Now, SARS never came to our shores. So the kinds of disasters that we're prepared for are things like hurricanes. So we're, we're a country that's really ready for weather disasters and hurricanes and tornadoes and things like that that are kind of these isolated events. They don't go on for a long time. You come in and the whole point is like, just get to supplies to a lot of people. Um, and then we'll sort of figure it out. Uh, and then we'll figure it out from there and we'll do some stimulus for whatever the area is and we're good to go. So one of the ways that you can think about that, like uh, that we are prepared for a different type of disaster is that most of our strategies for getting food to people who need food 
uh, have to do with what's called congregant feeding, which is like I have a really big baseball field and I bring everybody to the baseball field and I feed them there. Now, that's how you deal with it if you happen to be in a weather disaster situation. Like uh, that's what they were doing in terms of Sandy, um, Hurricane Sandy. But obviously, that's a really bad thing to do when you have coronavirus and you need to actually be getting food to, to individual places and individual people, right? So, um, so what I think is going to happen is that businesses, when they're trying to think about how do we deal with really bad downside events, are going to think too much about what if another pandemic comes and not kind of across the different ways that things can go sideways. So that's the other thing that I think is going to happen. And this, this just has to do with both of those things in terms of being probably a little bit too pessimistic in terms of like, what are your cash reserves and uh, what does your workforce look like? Um, you know, what kind of salaries are you paying? Who, who are you hiring? What are you thinking about in terms of, in terms of what your budgeting looks like? It's probably going to be a little bit too pessimistic. And then the things that they're going to be prepared for are going to look a little bit too much like specifically another pandemic coming along. Um, and then in the long run, what I think is going to happen is that everything's going to flip back to normal, which is people are just going to be underprepared in general. So if you think about it, it wasn't really that long ago that the Great Recession occurred. And certainly coming out of the Great Recession, people were thinking about having very big cash reserves. They were definitely thinking about what the size of their workforce wa was. Uh, they were thinking about how do they kind of ensure against this kind of disaster because they remembered it. It had just happened. But what's interesting is all it took was 10 years and nobody was ready for this. So it can go out of your mind pretty fast. <laughs> it's, uh, it's fascinating. I mean, I, I once had uh, a 360 review done on me, um, and the feedback came back that uh, me as a leader, uh, as a negative, was that I play not to lose. So I fell off the tracks a long time ago, and it, when, when I reflect on what you're saying, like, my cash position ends up being strong going into this thing because I was off the track. I've been playing on the reverse model for, for a long time. And so I tend to go like, like super pessimistic when things are good. I play like I have nothing. And then when things get really bad, I'm like, now I own the opportunity. So I'm like, it, it, it's a very complex thing that's going through my head. I'm, I'm cautious because of what's happening, but I'm optimistic on, on owning opportunities. But um, like in, in the franchise industry, which is much of our audience, like they tend to do the same thing. They stockpile or, or buck, buck, bunker down uh, when things get bad and they spend when things get good. But the reality is business owners come out of the woodworks when their jobs are at risk. So the reality is franchise brands need to be playing on opposite tracks too because now comes the time where you spend when you were spending when it was good there was no one that was jumping out and saying i want to be in business for myself so it's, it's fascinating because i i think you're completely right i think if if a restart is going to happen then the mindset has to shift now and say how do we hold on to this mindset longer on the Yeah, I, 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 I agree. So, so one thing that you just pointed out is that generally you want to be a little bit of, uh, you want to be a little bit contrarian, right? So uh, my guess is that as you're sort of keep thinking about what, what, what's going to happen if things kind of go south and what kind of cash position do I want to have, um, then you're actually just getting ahead of it and being prepared for it. And then what happens is that that becomes very, very valuable uh, in terms of being able to participate in the recovery as, as you move forward. So what you generally want to be thinking about is I don't want to be really spending a lot of time reacting to today. I want to have actually thought about today six months ago. And I want so so you always kind of want to be thinking months ahead or, or a year ahead. Um, and the way that you do that is you actually start to think about many, many different scenarios occurring. Um, and we just tend not to like that. And we tend, we tend to think that the way things are now is the way things are gonna always be. And there's a lot of bandwagon that goes on. So if our peers are um, spending in a particular way or reacting as if the world is telling them particular things, we'll tend to just kind of go along with that. And then from on, on kind of a micro level, 
uh, we, we behave that way on teams. So what teams really like is to have a lot of people on them who agree with each other. So uh, you can tell me if this is normally the way that like, you know, on teams that you've been on, most of the conversation is around, uh, you know, I'll say something and then uh, the next person will say, I just want to circle back to what Annie said, because I think I really agree with what she said. And I'm just going to add my own thoughts about why I agree with that. And then somebody else will say, I'd like to circle back and just join into that and say, I also agree with that. And here are my ideas about why that I agree with that. But that's really uninteresting, right? Like the fact that we all agree with each other, it's sort of like, okay, the earth is round. Yay us. Like, why are we spending so much time, you know, on that conversation? And the reason is that people don't like it when someone is on the opposite side of a, a decision or a perspective than they are, because we tend to have this idea that somehow that doesn't affirm our identity. So the way that I like to think about it is if you have an ideal team, you would have someone who is more uh, contrarian, right? So someone who is more pessimistic, who maybe wants to have more cash reserves, who doesn't want to spend, who wants to reduce force, whatever it is, and then someone who's more optimistic. And then the joy of that team is the fact that you get to have a conversation to try to find out what the truth really is. Um, so what I think about is like, the thing that I think about in terms of team dynamics and, and how teams work is that the reason why you have, suppose, you know, theoretically, the reason why you have uh, more than one person making a decision is that if you can bring more perspectives into the decision, the decision quality should increase. And the reason is that if I were to able, if I were able to say map the, the things that I believe and my perspectives on the world, and then I was able to map another team member's perspective on the world, and I overlaid those, it should be that what I see is that there's a lot of agreement, which would be like the palms. And then there's a lot of disagreement, which would be like the fingers. And the palms are pretty uninteresting. That's like, okay, we agree that the earth is round, but the fingers are really where the good stuff happens, right? I think that we should be reducing our force by 20%. And you think that we should be reducing our force by 50%. Okay, that's where there's a really interesting conversation to be had. But the problem is that for teams who like to feel like everybody's a team player and you're all on the same page, there's all sorts of ways in which we make it feel more like the team is like this, that everything is agreement. And, and there's all sorts of ways that we, we really suppress the fact that people have different views and we try to get them to sort of not express that, not necessarily really intentionally. This is mostly unintentional because we sort of feel like it's identity affirming for the team to agree. But what ends up happening then is that the thing that the team is supposed to do in terms of increasing the quality of a decision, which is to bring lots of perspectives into the decision actually now goes away because we're suppressing those different perspectives. And now the decision quality doesn't actually increase much more than if only one person were making the decision. But the problem is that the confidence in the decision goes up. So because we have the illusion that we sort of had more than one head in the decision, um, we think the decision is probably a lot better. But because of the way that that decision process has occurred, the decision process isn't actually better. So I want people like you on my team. So I would, if I'm running a team, I don't give a critique that somebody is too pessimistic. What I say is I really value the pessimistic voice pushing against the general optimism of the team in order to discipline our point of view. And what I want to do actually is figure out a way not to suppress it and give that as a criticism, but rather to say, how do we actually allow those different perspectives to bloom on the team so that everybody can embrace it and, and really value the fact that there are different perspectives that we now have to have a conversation about because the truth likely lies somewhere in the middle of the two. But if we don't hear both perspectives, we actually never get even close to the truth. Yeah, Annie, I, I mean, even just from our little world of franchising, I mean, that whole analysis in terms of the franchise or franchisee relationship, the feedback from franchisees, and boy, you know, as I'm thinking about this, talk about when a franchisee onboards with a brand, and if you could have a backcasting session one, two, three years out, and even for our firm, you know, someone 
franchises their business or is, you know, to project, you know, take that viewpoint from a year or two ahead. Um, it's an amazing framework. I, I mean, in business, um, it's a tremendous framework. I love the fact too, Annie, and I think you're right. I, I love your analysis on the fact that we're probably going to over index this crisis, um, which has profound effects because, you know, it sits in the back of my head that no one would have expected where we are today. They wouldn't even have expected it three weeks ago. And so, boy, if I'm extrapolating, you know, this could be a very different world come September, October, and we probably don't know what it's going to be or anticipate right. it. Right. So what, what's a really good thing to do? Like this is a, a thing about where you can get like from your team, you can get all these different perspectives, right? So one of the biggest problems that we have in terms of accessing the perspectives of other people, like getting other people's point of view is that we have those discussions in a group setting. And you can think about this. As soon as we start discussing something in a group setting, the minute that I offer my perspective, that now becomes the center of the discussion. And other people's perspectives are now putting being put in that framework. So let's say that I wanted to get sort of the the best complete view if I want if I had a group together whose opinions I really valued, and I wanted to start thinking about well, what is the fall going to look like? Here's a simple thing I can do. I can take all the people on my team. And I can email them and I could say, I would like you to give me your sort of, what are the top three ways in which you think that the fall might look really positive for our business? And what are the top three ways in which you think that the fall might look really negative for our business? Okay, so it's a very simple question. This is like not really a full backcast or a pre-mortem. You're just kind of querying on, if you were to look ahead at what the fall looks like, uh, in what ways do you think that it could look really good for us? And what ways do you think it could look really bad for us? But here's the key. You don't have that conversation as a team. You email them and get them to all give you that, that information independently where they don't have access to what the other people on the team think. Now you get the fullest view of all the ideas that people have about how things might go well and how things might go poorly. You can now collate that you can see where people came up with the exact same idea. That's really good signal. You can see people where people came up with unique ideas, which is also signal in itself. You can see where people have dispersion about what, how they think things might go well or how they think things, things might go poorly. And now that becomes the, the mode of discussion. But in the meantime, you've, at, you've sort of maximally accessed what all the people on the group think. And by doing it independently, you did something really important, which is that when people are on a team, it's very uncomfortable for them to feel like they're disagreeing with other people on the team. And in fact, a lot of times when someone does disagree with a per perspective and they are willing to say it, they'll wrap it in like a lot of bubble wrap. So they'll, they'll say things like, well, I appreciate your perspective, but I was kind of thinking like maybe there was another way to look at it and I'm not... You know, I'm not saying that what I'm saying is right, but just I'm one, you know, so there's all this like soft peddling of it. You're um, describing, Annie, you're describing my meetings, by the way. Right, okay. exactly. Right. Okay. So, okay. so you're not really just sort of like getting to, yeah. the, to the point. And now the, how, how much the person sort of what you think the level of that person's belief is has now been reduced because they're trying not to offend. Right. But that's not particularly great for decision making by mm -hmm. So, so, and then the other thing is that there's also this other thing that happens aside from the fact that people sort of soft pedal is that because people don't like to disagree, here's a thing that's really, really true. And I'm going to ask you this. What do you need to know from me in order to know that you're disagreeing with me? Like if I were just to say, if, if, if I were to ask your opinion about a movie that we've, we've both seen, what is it that you need to know for me in order to know that you're disagreeing with me? Whether you like the movie or... Yes. Right. You need to know what my opinion is. So therefore, what that means is that if we're in a group setting, I, I, I'm, you're going to know what my opinion is before you get to say yours. And if I may withhold my opinion, but as soon as person two expresses their opinion, everybody now knows that they, they might be disagreeing. Yeah. By just emailing people in advance and then saying, hey, send me your answers independently. Don't reply all. Just reply to me. 
Send me your answers independently. Nobody knows that anybody's disagreeing with anyone. And now it allows everybody's opinions to bloom. So by the way, I would have never said to you, I think that you're too pessimistic. Like if I were, if I were giving you feedback. I would say, I'm so happy that you're giving me a different perspective and a different way to look at the world. And I think that that really helps to discipline the over optimism of the group and get us to a place that's of more objective truth. And that's what you're trying to do. And it's really interesting because the simple act of soliciting these opinions independently actually in a very subtle way starts to reinforce that idea that what you really value is the diversity of the opinion on the team, the different ways that people look at each other and then what that does is it instantiates basically like a culture where you're not, your team is cohesive, not because you all automatically agree with each other. Your team is cohesive because you're all really open-minded to everybody's opinion and you're eager to see them. So imagine just that. I get everybody's opinions independently. I now compile those into a document where the opinions are anonymous. I just say, here's all the things that people thought. Here's the things that more than one person thought. And here's the things that only one person thought. I put that together into here are the great things that could happen for us in the fall. Here are the bad things that could happen for us in the fall. And I send that out to the group, let everybody digest it. And then we have a meeting to discuss it. Think about how much better that would go. Yeah, no, it, it, look, I, even our meeting this morning, our attraction meeting, sometimes I'm over influencing the meeting. Um, that, like for me, it, Annie, I, it, again, I, I'm just amazed at your analytical framework. Also, my other thoughts are why do we have stupid politicians? Why don't you run for some office? Because I hate them all. No, please. I, Never. I hate them. And I'm like, but this is where the talent and the value of our nation is as opposed to these people that spend their whole lives after college just being politicians, right? This is what's wrong. But this, just this last point, I mean, you just, you just diagnosed one of, and we have a great team and a great culture, but you've diagnosed the systemic issue in our meetings that I don't see. And I even think my team tries to communicate to me and it, you just like hit it on the head. I mean, a very big way. Yeah, it, I mean, it just allows everybody's opinions to breathe. And then the other thing that I always say in those team meetings is that, so now you have this really great information, right? And as I said, most team meetings tend to linger on the places of agreement. People like to sort of echo each other. But now what you've done is you've elicited that agreement in advance. So who's ever facilitating the, the meeting just says, hey, here's the places where we have a lot of agreement. That's really wonderful. We all have a lot of agreement around that. And you just write those up on a board and you say, okay, that's awesome. And then you say, but this is what I'm really interested in, <laughs> right? Here, there's a lot of dispersion. People have like a really different idea about this stuff. So like you could think about how could you do it in terms of just like a sales projection, right? What I say, what I, I say to everybody, hey, can you just send me independently before this what you think that uh, the sales projections are for the next quarter, right? And so you just get that, right? And then there's a couple of people who are like way out at the tails. One person thinks it's gonna, you know, is really low, one person's really high, and that's great. And then you walk in the meeting, you say, okay, most of us were kind of here, but then, you know, th these two people were pretty far apart. I'd love to hear their perspectives because that's what's really interesting to me. And then the whole idea is not so much about one person trying to convince the other person, it's about conveying why they believe what they, they do. And then when you think about it as conveying as opposed to convincing, then the whole group gets educated as to why does this person have this perspective? And it allows people to be more open-minded to, to sort of seeing that that perspective may have some validity, right? If a person who's really, really well-informed, who's a member of your team has a much more pessimistic view of what sales might look like in the next quarter than say the majority of the team, you should actually be having a really big discussion trying to understand why they believe that. Not trying to convince them to agree with the rest of the group, but trying to understand their perspective such that you really get it and you can repeat it back to them because most likely what they say should be incorporated into your forecast. That's the most likely scenario, assuming they're well-informed. Annie, do you, in terms of cadence, 
do you recommend like if there's monthly meetings that you go through going through this process on a monthly basis? Yes. That's awesome. Absolutely. And I mean, one, of reasons, one of the reasons That's why awesome. I like doing that on a monthly basis is because, and this is what COVID has taught us. The world is a very, very uncertain place. When we think about making any decision, any decision we make is essentially a prediction about the future because we have a bunch of different options and we're trying to decide which option to choose. And the option we choose is the one that we are predicting will result in the best possible future for us. So we are making forecasts all the time. Those forecasts are based on models of the world that have different inputs. But what the, that model is should be able to be changed, right? It shouldn't be set in stone because the conditions of the world change. Sometimes we gather a lot of new information that would actually change the inputs into the model or decide that maybe we were modeling it in a way that we, we sort of want to tweak or change. The problem is that, and this is particularly bad for people who have had a lot of success and who consider themselves to be subject matter experts, is that they have a very, very strong model of the world that they became very, become very entrenched in. And they think that it is a perfect predictor of the future. And that as the world starts to give them signals that maybe their model should be adjusted, they actually will reinterpret the new data that's coming in to fit their model, as opposed to reinterpret their model to fit the data. And we know this, right? When people have been doing stuff for, how many times have you heard someone who's been doing stuff for a really long time and you suggest a different perspective and they say, I know that's not right. And you say, why? And they say, because I've been doing this forever. That's literally their answer, right? So by doing this on a monthly basis, what you're constantly reinforcing is this. At this moment in time, this is my best prediction of the future. I think that the model I have is the best that I can do and I'm really good at it given the information that I have in this moment and given my predictions about what the state of the world might be in the future. But I'm gonna revisit this in a month because I have to hold that pretty loosely. So I am highly convicted in the moment that I make the decision, but then I am willing to adjust as new information comes in. So by continually doing these like pre-mortems and these back casts and, and, and getting the, the, the inputs from your team independently prior to getting into a group, what you're reinforcing in this is this open-mindedness that I am always kind of looking out into the world. The other thing that the pre-mortems and back casts do for you is that they allow you to create much better signposts. So one of the things that you would ask is, let's say that uh, I have some idea about what the world is gonna look like in six months. And it turns out that the, the most likely scenario that, that I think was gonna occur is not the one that's occurring. What do I think would be true of the world in that case? What is happening in the world? So I think, let's say that I predict that we're gonna have a V-shaped recovery. And I say to myself, okay, my prediction is we're gonna have a V-shaped recovery. So let me actually do a little forecasting of that. Uh, and, uh, and I'm gonna imagine that the recovery isn't V-shaped. Why was I wrong? What are the things that were true of the world that made it so that I was wrong? Now, when you do that, you now have a list of signposts that you can be looking out for. And you can now include that in your decision process. Well, if these things start to be true of the world, that would be a signal that my forecast of a V-shaped recovery, maybe I should be adjusting that and start thinking that it's gonna be a U-shaped recovery. But because you've done that in advance, you're more likely to spot those signposts earlier because you're gonna be less likely to be fitting the data to your model of a V-shaped recovery. And you're more likely to see that the data might be telling you that you should be adjusting to a U-shaped recovery and you'll do that more quickly. So th this is also like, like what you're describing is asset management as a leader too, because so many leaders don't go to a vulnerable place to say, hey, let me lean on my assets, which your your people are your assets. Right. They they dictate this is the way we do things and they well, don't solicit yeah. feedback. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean you're you've already given a guideline because because the reality is, hey, in, in my opinion, not one CEO that exists right now has the answer. Uh, therefore they're sitting around scrambling. Um, and if they weren't vulnerable before, they better get there now because if they look around at the asset management, the people around them are going to be there to help them navigate this mess. And all the tools you just gave them, there's your pathway. If you just listen and get vulnerable and go back to the 
using our assets, you're gonna you'll figure out a path. It might not be perfect, and business might might not look the same as it did yesterday, but at least you're 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 using your resources to say, team, team, I need you. And I think that's okay. And that's that's the vulnerability that I would love to see CEOs get to to be able to admit you might be smart, but you don't have all the answers. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that that's exactly right. And I, as much as you can take that attitude out of out of this situation into your everyday decision making, uh, I think that, that it's the better off we are. Because so so one of the frameworks that, that you can think about uh, what I'm trying to get there to be a marriage of is the inside view and outside view. So the, the inside view is the world from your own perspective. So I'm sure you've heard tons and tons of stuff about cognitive bias, things like confirmation bias, uh, which is like we tend to look at the world to confirm our prior beliefs. Um, and we notice information like we read news that confirms our prior beliefs. We talk to people who confirm our prior beliefs, like all of that stuff. Uh, overconfidence bias, which is sort of thinking that we're better at something than we are. There's something called the above average effect. There's uh, here's one uh, recency bias, which would be over indexing to COVID that things that have happened recently, we then as we forecast into the future, we think they're more likely to occur than, than they actually statistically are. So when we think about the inside view, think about you're looking at the world from your own perspectives and things that are particular to your situation and the experiences that you happen to have had. And that's really where like cognitive bias lives, right? That's where our really strongly held models of the world live uh, and we'll, we'll tend to conform data to fit our models as opposed to the other way around. So that's the inside view. The outside view is the world from uh, somebody else's perspective or what's true of the world in general. So I'll give you like a couple of examples of the collision of the inside view and outside view to hopefully try to clarify it for you. Uh, let's say that I'm starting a business and it's a, a, a I'm, I'm going to start some sort of business and I think that I'm really great at the, what I what I do and I think that I have amazing strategy uh, and it's a particular type of business, say a restaurant business, obviously not now um, during COVID, but I'm starting this in pre-COVID times uh, and I think that I've got the best chef and a great location and I'm an amazing business owner. And so from my perspective, maybe I project that I think that the probability that my restaurant will be successful at the end of year one is 90%. Okay, so that's from my own perspective. But if I go look up what's true of the world in general, if all I do is Google, what percentage of restaurants fail within the first year, I will find out that that is 60%. So that's the outside view. And so those two things should collide. And once I understand that in general, it's true that only 40% of restaurants are still successful after the first year or still running after the first year, that my projection of 90%, I should probably bring that down a little bit. So that's like one way to see the collision of the inside and outside view. Another way, this is one that I always joke about, is like if you're talking to a friend and they're telling you about their really bad dating history and they're like, oh, I've dated 10 people, you know, the last 10 people I've dated have all been jerks. They're, you know, I go out on these dates and they're all total jerks. And I can't believe that these, you know, all these jerks keep coming into my life. Um, that's the inside view where none of it seems to be their own responsibility and people are just being awful to them. The outside view as the friend who's listening to it is maybe there's something about the people that you're choosing to go on dates with where you're picking jerks. Or maybe there's something about the way that you behave on dates or behave in relationships that make people who otherwise wouldn't be so jerky kind of turn into jerks. Or maybe they're not really jerks and you're like too sensitive and your standards are too high. Like there's all sorts of ways that I would interpret that that would be a different perspective than the one that they have. So you can have two people who are looking at the exact same data in the exact same situation and they can come to very, very different conclusions about it. So, so what we really want to do is get the inside view to collide with the outside view. Okay, so now if you think about the problem with a CEO, so the CEO, like everybody else, is living in the inside view because we're all living in our own perspectives and our own models of the world and our own experience and kind of what's worked for us particularly in the past or what strategies have worked for us. And we tend to, particularly when things have gone well, and when we're very successful, we tend to over attribute all the great things that ever happened to us to skill. And we think that it's all because of our great decision making and none of it has to do with luck 
because we're just awesome and that's how we got to our place. And so we think that our models of how you make decisions and how you process information and the kinds of strategic choices that you should be making within a business are clearly correct because they've worked in the past. So that's very much the inside view. Now, why do you have a team around you? Well, theoretically, it should be to discipline your own view of the world, to discipline the inside view and to start bringing in some other perspectives from other people that can help to sort of collide with yours in order to get you to something that's probably closer to the objective truth. In the same way that my friend who thinks that they, you know, that there's all these jerks that just appear, keep appearing in their life, if they heard my perspective that maybe they're picking jerks, it would be helpful for them to hear that so that they could then adjust their strategy going forward. So what we wanna do is have those two things collide. The way that most leaders operate is that they dictate. They tell people, this is what I think is correct and this is how we are gonna then do things. And so that is just basically spreading the inside view, their own inside view on the team and the team becomes just sort of one big organism with one view of the world, which is the opposite of what you wanna get from the team. If you actually solicit advice and you lean on your team in this way, in a way that, that requires more, more humility and requires that other people's points of view actually may have uh, a lot of validity and maybe in some cases more validity than the view that you have, then that's actually gonna allow you to get something that's better in terms of the objective truth, which is obviously gonna improve your decision-making because your model of the world is gonna get better, which is gonna allow you to be a better predictor of the future. But in order to do that, you have to be humble and you have to be willing to listen to what the other people say. And you have to not linger on the agreement. You have to linger on the places where the opinions are, are, are different, where they diverge. And that all takes work. Annie, I, I'm gonna, again, take it from where it comes from. I will predict this was probably the best analysis and on the internet today and all week. No, I, I guarantee it actually. No, no. I, I have to tell you, my, one of the comments is from Melissa on my team who just, who posted, we need Annie at our meetings. Like, <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So that's Melissa and her husband. Hey, on Melissa. Yeah. So, and I, you know, we, we put in a good effort. And so I think you've just Diagnose. I, I mean, you just didn't explain the problem. You provided, provided a diagnosis and the clarity of your framework is amazing. So if you could run for office, that would be great. But my prediction is, I'm not just saying this, this is absolutely the best information disseminated on the internet this week. Um, I, 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 I mean, I took so many notes just because. Oh, I love that. You know, look. I mean, just nonstop. Oh my gosh! Well, that's cool. you know. I mean, look. If I if I had to tell if I had to get one pe one 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 message across to people, it's that I know you think that what is happening right now in terms of the amount of uncertainty is really unusual. And yes, is is the uncertainty higher than normal? Sure, because we there's a whole bunch of data that we just don't have about the virus. But what you need to realize is that it's just shining a light on the uncertainty. That's all it's doing. It's just exposing it. It's like it was hiding over in a dark corner and you were pretending that it wasn't there or yeah. like it was under your bed and you failed to vacuum under there, you know, <laughs> in a month. But now what COVID has done is it's gotten you to take a flashlight and like shine a light on what's actually sitting under your bed. And you can now see all of the, like all of the stuff that you didn't want to see before because it's like dust bunnies and, and whatever that you're kind of trying to ignore and try to pretend that it doesn't exist. So as you try to think through, how do I decide in this environment? How do I think about the world and what the future might hold in this environment? When we come out of this, you're gonna get lulled into, into again, sort of pushing uncertainty back into the shadows and don't get lulled into that. Realize while it may not be to the same degree it is at the moment, that this is more like what the world looks like all the time than what you previously thought. And so just understand, like you said, if you're iterating these things once a month or even once a quarter and you're, you're doing the strategic planning where you're really looking ahead and you're saying, what if the economy goes south in six months? Or what if the economy goes south in, in, in a year? Are we prepared for that? What if it starts to boom? 
Do we have a plan to really take advantage of it? Which are the different ways that that could happen? And you can do that in little ways too. Like we're thinking about hiring this person. Right. And obviously you think you've gone through a great hiring process and you are really highly confident that that person is going to be like amazing and they're going to be the best employee ever because that's what we think. We, we think we have more control over it. But take the time to say it's a year from now. And man, we really wish we had fired that person. Why? What are the most likely reasons that we wish that we had never hired this person in the first place? Or it's a year from now and we think that this, we actually think this person is the best hire we ever made. Like, what do we think are the most likely reasons that that is true? Now, that doesn't mean that you're not necessarily going to hire them. But what it means is that you're going to figure out, well, here are the reasons why I think that this person might have been somebody who turned out to be a terrible hire. Again, that gives you signposts that allow you to get in front of, as you start to see those things go south, you're gonna tend to, to get to it much more quickly because we all know most of us take way too long to actually let somebody go. Um, and then they cause all sorts of problems because they've poisoned the well and like horrible things. Or we're just not fast enough to, to sort of start to fill in their, their skill gaps or to try to make sure that things are, that we're addressing the problems. But what this allows you to do is realize that even when you think that something is so certain that you've got someone who has a great CV, who has a great interview, all of their references are amazing. And you think it's so certain that they're an amazing hire. Just by going through the process of saying, let's imagine it's a year from now and we really regret this hire, reminds you that even something like that is really, really highly uncertain. I mean, this, this advice, and, and I, look, everybody that's listening, I would, I would say the category ends up being primarily those in business. So you're probably listening to what Annie has to say in the lens, how can this impact my company? But the, the dust bunny is death. I mean, we treat life like it's going to last forever. We don't, we don't focus on happiness. We, we, so, so this advice should be uh, cross applied to the way that you live your life, the way that you manage your family, the way that you manage your money, the way that you manage your business. Like th this is sound advice. So I hope that anybody that's listening to this doesn't just say what Annie's saying, let me cross apply that to my business. I mean, th this is human stuff. And, you know, I, I appreciate this. I mean, this, I, I, I echo what Charles said. I mean, this is like my, my brain has exploded inside. Oh, no. You've made this, you, you, you've made, you put this into context that I think a lot of, a lot of people struggle to explain this, and it's so sound that I, I'm gonna I'm gonna watch this back probably multiple times because it is such sound advice. Uh, it, it, it's amazing, and I appreciate that. So can I can I add one other? I just want to add one other framework that I think that COVID uh, has has really really kind of brought to the surface that I think is something really important that actually applies in all sorts of different ways. So there's an asymmetry when we're thinking that we have to do something painful versus when we're thinking that we have to do something great. Um, so when we feel like there's something happy on our horizon, we'll very often decide too early because we want to bank the win. So you can think about it as like, we've got some paper mark. We have like on paper, we've gained something or on paper, we've lost something. And the question is, how eager are you to realize, make it a realized gain or a realized loss? Okay, so you can think about, like, for example, uh, I someone t tells me in June that I'm doing a great job and I'm probably going to get an amazing bonus in December, right? So this is where I'm looking at something really awesome on the horizon. I might draw down off of that bonus in some way. Uh, before I've actually got the bonus in hand, right? So maybe now I borrow and I buy myself a fancy car as a treat um, in September. But then, of course, all sorts of stuff can intervene in there because life is uncertain. And maybe now coronavirus hits and I don't get my bonus in September and now I'm carrying this big debt because I, I wanted to turn that into a gain really, really early before I was certain that that bonus was going to come in. Okay, so that's on the gain side. But now let's think on the loss side. And we can think about this in terms of this kind of like domino of lockdowns that have occurred. Now we know that that locking down is really, really painful. There's no question that putting people in lockdown and putting an economy on pause is one of the most painful things that any country has to decide. But what have we seen country by country and even state by state that people lock down too late? 
right? So, so you can see like, obviously China wasn't giving great information. So let's ignore them because they were slow to tell the world what was going on. But everybody saw what happened in Lombardy, Italy. They were very slow to lock down. By the time they locked down, it was a complete disaster. Then what does France do right next door? They're really slow to lock down. By the time they lock down, it's a total disaster. Then what happens in Spain? They're really slow to lock down, so on and so forth. What happens in New York? There's hundreds of cases by the time New York locks down. Now, obviously, if you lock down when there's like no cases, then it's like a 14 day lockdown and we're all kind of done. So by being very, very slow to lock down, what happens is you actually extend it and you can see like, so New York was slow to lock down, but then you can see that states in general are waiting until they have kind of hundreds of cases before they seem to be willing to lock down. And we know that by hundreds of cases, you're kind of late to the game. Okay, so what is, what is going on there? Well, when we have to do something painful, like locking down, we'll do the opposite of what we do when we spend against a bonus too early, which is we want to be, we want to have a level of uncertainty that the bad versions of the future are unfolding that's unreasonably high before we're willing to do the painful thing. So we want to know that it's really, really bad before we lock the, you know, before we lock things down, as opposed to sort of getting it to it early pulling the Band-Aid off and saying, okay, we're just going to get to this early. Okay, so now how does this apply to our everyday lives, right? Well, we can go back to the hiring example, right? Have, doing something as simple as having to sit down with an employee and give them a negative review or negative feedback, that's painful. We don't like to do it. We don't like to have those human interactions where we're having to tell something, somebody something that we know is going to make them unhappy. Uh, it can create conflict and it's unpleasant. Now, but I think that we can all agree that if you see something happening with an employee that you would, that is, looks like maybe you'd like to be addressing it, it's better to address it early rather than later. But because it's painful, we don't address it until later. So what we want to do is be really, really, really certain that there's a problem with that employee before we'll sit down and actually address it. And generally, when we're thinking about those kinds of things, and this is true also with reduction in force, right? When we think about laying people off, it's an incredibly unpleasant thing to have to lay somebody off. Nobody wants to do it, rightly so. You're, you're having a really big effect, obviously, on the person that you're laying off. And it's, it's unpleasant. It's not fun. It, 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 it's a horrible feeling to have to do that. And but as you're balancing out that decision against the survival of your business and the ability to maybe be able to keep the employees you have or to be able to hire more people in the future, sometimes, you know, devastatingly, that's a decision that you have to make. But people want to be really, really, really certain that they have to actually reduce their force before they're willing to actually make those cuts because they're painful. And what you see over and over again is that people make that decision too late in the game. By then, it's usually too late in terms of what they need to do in terms of creating runway for themselves to be able to get through this. So even in small things, like when do you actually decide to sit down and give an employee negative feedback? We'll tend to delay it until it's already maybe a little bit too late, because by the time that you're certain that you need to have that conversation, it's usually not going to be as productive or as useful or even solve the problem than if you do it earlier. So this is something, again, where you can think about something that, that COVID kind of teaches us about what is our willingness to engage in, in, in behaviors that, we, that are gonna cause us pain um, under conditions where we're very uncertain whether we actually need to do those things. We want really, really high certainty. And by the time you have enough certainty, it's usually too late. And then the flip side of that is that when we wanna engage in things that are gonna cause us a lot of joy, will generally be willing to do that with too little certainty. And so we do that too early. And what you really want to try to do is get to the sweet spot between those two things. It, not, so Annie, what's the best way to balance those two out, right? Right. Because yeah. in my mind, I'm fighting a battle here, right? Our team is like, 
you know, we're battling recovery. I, I, I guess your answer is to go through the analysis, right? So, yeah. yeah, it's it's six months from now and you're out of business. Yeah. What are the things okay. you really wish that you had not spent money on? Yeah. Right. It's six months from now and there was a V-shaped recovery and you didn't get to participate in it. What are the things that you really wish you had done in order to make sure that you were ready for that? Now, some of those things might not be um, keeping uh, something as simple as keeping staff on. It might be that you wish that you would really had a plan for ramp up, right? That you were ready to go, that you you had kept whatever the infrastructure was in place that would allow you to be ready to go. But but that's really where you get to that, right? Like it's six months from now, or it's a year from now, or it's 18 months from now, I'm out of business. What are the things that I really wish that I had done? What are the thing, what are the th what are the top five things I wish I hadn't spent money on? Right? And and you can get that from the different members of your team. Allow in, instead of hiding those those kinds of thought processes from your team, um, you should have your team participate in that because it makes your team feel like they have control over the process. It allows them to understand where the decision making is coming from, which actually creates more cohesion. Because here's a secret, your team already knows that all those thoughts are going through your head, right? They understand what the uncertainty right is, is right now. They understand what the existential risk is to businesses right now because of this economic dislocation. So they're all experiencing that anxiety in private and they're all living in their own heads with it, um, which is actually a, a road to, to disaster, right? By doing these kinds of things with the team and saying, okay, it's, it's a year from now and we're out of business. What are the top five things that we wish we hadn't spent money on? What are the top five things we wish we had done differently than what we're doing right now? And you allow them to answer it. It, it actually relieves anxiety because it, it surfaces all of the anxiety that exists anyway. It allows you to have a productive conversation about it. It allows them to feel like they're part of the decision-making process. And it, it creates cohesion on the team that otherwise wouldn't exist as people are sitting at the water cooler, like looking at each other sideways saying like, do you think we're going to have a job tomorrow? Right. That This allows there to be a conversation wh wh where there's honesty and participation by the people. Now, obviously, you wouldn't do this with all your employees. You do this with 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 the people on your team that would be appropriate for that type of decision making, but allow them into a process. And it also relieves stress for you because your decision making is going to improve in the process, it's gonna make your decisions better. And you also want them to do the happy thing, right? It's six months from now and our, our business is thriving. Like wh what did we do that made that happen? What do we wish we had done differently than what we're doing right now that, allow, you know, that would have allowed this business to, to be thriving, right? So you get to do both sides of the equation and you invite everybody into that conversation. That way you're much, much more likely to get into the sweet spot. Because if when you were thinking about buying that car in September, before you actually got that bonus, and you said, okay, it's, it's December uh, and I didn't get the bonus <laughs> for whatever reason, or the bonus was less than I thought, did I really, am I, am I happy that I actually bought this car? Do I regret it? The answer of course is always yes. And then you can get yourself out of that desire to get that immediate gratification and say, is it really like, am I okay with waiting three months to buy the car until I actually get the bonus? In the future, am I gonna be happier about that decision to just wait the three months? Or am I gonna be happier that I just got the car today? And I don't really know any human beings who aren't like, of course I'd be happier that I waited the three months. Because I've lived this one before. We've all lived this in a variety of different ways where we just like bank the loss, I mean, we bank the win and then it doesn't come in. Like there's all sorts of different ways that we've all experienced that. And that just reminds us of that. It allows us to get sort of a bigger scope of time and out of the immediate gratification or the immediate sort of feeling of wanting to offload the pain into a place where you can get to better decision-making and, and walk that line between the two. Annie, this, this has been such a pleasure. Uh, and, and there's so there's so much to unwind here. I mean, Charles and I will probably spend hours on the phone later talking through all this stuff. <laughs> uh, I don't know if that's good or bad, but okay. You know, Annie, I'm backcasting weather, and we have a great community, and I'm like, you know, what is it going to look like 18 months from now when we have a live session together and – how do we convince Annie to come? <laughs> um, yeah, now this this is all I could ever say is thank you. 
and I am so humbled by what you've shared. Really am. Well, I'm I'm humbled by the reaction for sure. And I, yeah, I want you to run for office too, Annie. Please. <laughs> I don't want to run for office. It would be too horrifying. <laughs> um, I don't even know. It's like the the climate right now is a little bit odd, but anyway, I would like, I would like one chance to just say like, when, when I'm thinking about this kind of decision-making stuff, I mean, I think that one of the problems is, and, and you can tell me if this is true for you, is that I feel like our, our educational system, like our K through 12 educational system focuses so much on just like, you know, trigonometry, which I'm not even sure, like, I mean, I know engineers use it, but I suppose you could probably learn that in college. Um, it, it focuses on some weird stuff and it doesn't, it doesn't focus on these kinds of fundamentals. Like how do you actually think through decisions? How do you understand that when you're making a decision, it's really a prediction about the future. And how do you think about how you might model that? Right? Like how do you actually consider what your options are? And these are conversations that you can have with kindergartners, right? You can say like, what are your different choices? If you make this choice, like what, how do you think that's going to go? If you make this choice, how do you think that's going to go? I mean, it depends on the language. And then obviously you can get into much more decision analysis kind of stuff as people start to get into high school. But I feel like this is just a huge deficit um, in the way that we're teaching our kids in K through 12 in terms of giving them these kinds of fundamentals about how do you think through making good decisions. So I just wanna say putting my money where my mouth is. Um, I did co-found uh, a nonprofit called the Alliance for Decision Education. Um, and I hope that people will look it up because what we're really doing is field building around decision education. So I'm sure you you guys have heard of uh, social emotional learning. Um, and all of a sudden, like a decade ago, you started seeing this focus on making sure that social emotional learning was um, in schools and being taught to every kid. That was because an organization, a few organizations were behind the scenes, really trying to build up awareness and start to build that field and accelerate um, other nonprofits that were working on social emotional learning and until it became a real thing. And there was just a lot of pressure to get that into schools. And we feel like it's equally important to do that with decision education. And that's what we're doing at the Alliance for Decision Education. Um, I'm gonna ask people if, if don't please don't donate to us because we're financially fine at the moment. And I think that food banks and all sorts of other things are much, much more important to donate. But I would uh, too. But I would love people to be aware of it. If people have uh, programs or schools that they think would be interested in partnering with us or whatever, please let us know. You can get us at the Alliance for Decision Education .org. Um, And then after this is all over, we would love donations. <laughs> uh, but right now, we feel like the donations, you know, obviously should should be going to things that that are directly um, helping people who are really in need at the moment, particularly as we see these unemployment numbers just these, you know, just incredibly unfathomable. It's just, it's just so devastating. So, um, so please don't donate, but whatever, but, but partnerships, thinking about it, being aware of us uh, and spreading the word that this is what we're doing right now uh, would be incredibly valuable to us. And you yeah, can follow yeah, us I, on I, Twitter, I, I, all for Decision Edge on, I have, on Twitter. I have some clients that uh, are perhaps watching this that you should know. So uh, That'd I'll, be great. I'll make sure that connected afterwards. But again, thank you from both of us. I mean, this, this was phenomenal. Uh, appreciate you. Appreciate the time. Uh, appreciate your personality and oh. kindness. Um, 17 years later, we got to talk again. <laughs> so let's not, let's, we'll make sure it's not 17 more years. Yeah, yeah, for sure. We need to make sure that we get together again sooner. All right, Annie, dude, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you,